All right, so today I'm going to be interviewing Mel from Sneakers Corner. I'm going to be talking about the origins of Islam. But first, I'm going to give a quick update on what's happening on my channel. Uh, I recently signed up for Twitter on the urging of a couple people, so you can follow me at Reasoned Answers. I'll also put the link in the description box. Just finished recording my next video. Um, I'm going to be talking about the future of religion in general, and particularly the future of Christianity. I'll talk briefly about Islam, but since I already did a full-length video on Islam, it won't be the main topic of that video. Uh, the next video after that, I think I'm going to do uh, a fun short video on unicorns in the Bible, and with a look at why it's not always the best idea to use the King James translation. Uh, and then uh, next week, Mel is going to be interviewing me on his channel. Sounds great. Um, All, right. All right, so I'll go ahead and let's dive into the interview. So why don't you start by talking a little bit about your background, uh, where you grew up, and uh, what re role religion played in your life growing up. Sure, yeah. So um, I thought a good way to start um, uh, about my background is maybe to start with my name, because I've often been asked, you know, what does my name mean? Is it short for anything? And uh, so actually my name is like the um, Irish equivalent to Abdul. It means slave, which I find quite in interesting. It's the shortened version of Melissa, which means slave of Jesus. And... Uh, and very recently, just this year, uh, I discovered that my middle name, which I won't reveal, means freed man, which was given to me when I got baptized. So as a Christian, I first I take that as a good sign, you know, you know, we're freed by Christ. Um, so my my background is I'm a Catholic. Um, and uh, so I kind of, you know, that's the tradition I come from. A lot of people assume uh, when a Catholic says they're Catholic, that I'm Roman Catholic, but there are 24 different rites in the Catholic Church, and I just happen to be one, but identify myself more as Catholic rather than than specific denomination, Roman Catholic, if that makes sense. Um, and I kind of try and draw from different traditions, and I like to kind of connect with other Christians from, mm -hmm. from different mm -hmm. backgrounds, particularly in this work. Um, there are a lot of uh, great people working in this field who are Orthodox, who are from... Uh, Christian evangelist backgrounds and so on. So, so that's where I come from. Um, just a little bit, say, about my religious background. Um, my family is very religious. Um, one of my earliest memories as a child was four years of age. Um, I was in the back of a classroom, and it was a very contemplative sort of boy. And I had this image in my mind of uh, of a person walking down a pathway, and it was like the the archetypical pathway to either heaven or hell. And I saw one one of them going down towards hell and then changing his mind and heading back towards hell. And I don't know if it was words in my mind or just a thought, which was that, well, if I ever end up heading down that road, I must remember to turn back towards heaven. So that's kind of like like a childhood memory that has stuck with me all my life. Um, as a teenager, I remember receiving a Bible from a teacher and I studied it, you know, feverishly at the time. And I, I quickly learned the pearls of trying to interpret the Bible just from your own steam, you know. And I, <laughs> I had, I came up with mad ideas of what the Book of Revelations meant. Uh, so that was a good learning lesson. And I realised actually, you know, that you have to be um, very careful if you think you understand the Bible. There's a lot to 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 be learned from it. And I remember my mum was fearful what am i doing reading a bible that was you know, from her perspective that was kind of scary you know and uh, and ironically a few years later she became much more like into reading the bible excuse me reading the bible a little bit later in my life i was a fr franciscan friar for a couple of years so i give the lord first shot after i did my uni um i realized god is calling me somewhere else and uh, i think you know in my life i feel that my work with Islam is sort of like my calling. Um, so, yeah, so that's just a little bit of background. Maybe I, I might talk about how I got in, into this um, with, with um, Islam. I used to live about an hour away from London, and I saw one of Jay Smith's videos about Petra, and I was fascinated. And at the end of his video, he says, oh, you know, he often goes to Speaker's Corner in London, 
on a on a particular time on a Sunday. So I thought I'll go along. I'd love to see him in person. And I went up to him at the end of his talk, and I shook hands with him. And to my great surprise, he said, "You know, we're all gathering in a cafe. You can come along and you know join with us." And I thought this is amazing. So I became a regular and learned from from his feet, literally, you know. And uh, yeah, so I tried to support him whatever way I could, but I didn't feel brave enough at that point. That this would be back in 2016. But at that stage, I hadn't any thoughts of starting the channel. I was just kind of like in the background. So when I did start my channel, which was about a year ago, Sneakers Corner was the name I chose because of a reference to the fact that, you know, I was mainly focused on Speaker's Corner at that stage in terms of making videos about well, the debates, but gradually it became clear that what I was most interested in was the origins of Islam. So that's a, my intro. Oh, that very good. Sense. Yes, uh, you answered a couple of my questions there. I was going to ask how you became interested in Islam, but through Jay is a great way to get involved. And then I was going to ask you, um, what is the focus of your channel? I've been on it. Uh, there's a lot of great videos on the origins of Islam, looking at it from a number of different angles. It's a really, really interesting uh, subject because, uh, you know, you got this, the traditional history, but that was written a long time later. So then it's kind of difficult to determine the, the true origins. So it's just a great, I think it's a great area to study yeah, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Well, I suppose, um, so a question that might arise is, I like how much of that story do I believe, this, the traditional Islamic story? And I was thinking about that and it's literally almost none of it. <laughs> I, believe, I believe that Muhammad was a real person. So I believe he's a historical figure. I believe that approximately the, the dates given of when he was born, when he died, are roughly correct. But even those are questionable. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. But there is so much of it that when I scratched the surface, it gave way. And it, it, there was no solid basis to an awful lot of it. And it is an article of faith, you know, the story. And maybe as I kind of go through the Islamic history and the origins of what I've discovered, it'll become clear to, to your viewers why I think so much of it is, is basically a fiction. But yeah. there was a real person. I, I think actually, if there's one thing, if Muslims are watching this, one of the things I've got from it, actually, when you peel away the false story, there is an element uh, underneath which actually could sort of uh, rehabilitate Muhammad to some extent. He probably wasn't as bad as Muslims make him out to be, which is ironic, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Absolutely. So this is an area that I've done a, a great deal of study on. Um, you know, I, I've definitely watched a number of Jay's videos, and um, I watched uh, Dan Gibson's uh, documentary on the subject, and that was really fascinating. Yeah. But from what little I understand, this whole subject is probably much a relatively new study in academia that it's only been taking place in the last 50 years or so, maybe. Yeah, that would be right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um uh, from what I saw, or at least from what I learned from Jay, uh, that maybe the one of the first people to get involved with this area was uh, Patricia Crone. Um, and she, what she did is she looked at a number of maps and other primary texts from the period, and she couldn't really find any mention of Mecca, uh, which doesn't make any sense when you look at the traditional account that you know is supposedly a big giant city, major trade center, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so how familiar are you with her work? Yeah, I've read two of her books. Um, I've read her book, which she wrote with, I think it was Michael Cook uh, back in the 70s on Hegarianism. Uh, so just to tell you a little bit about that first. It wasn't a very convincing uh, thesis. And, you know, it was panned and she later um, agreed with the panning. But there was some there was a core of uh, idea there that actually she was spot on, which was the idea that the Persians had a huge influence in terms of the, the uh, Zoroastrian religion. And since reading the book, I started noticing a lot of these things that she was pointing out. She also was trying to suggest that Samaritanism, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, had an influence. But actually, I think I think that was a bit of a stretch, and it was hard to prove her case. 
Um, but it was a difficult read. But I think the the book that really grabbed me was her book. I'm going to read it from here: "The Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam." And as you mentioned, when she looked at the map, she discovered that you know the story doesn't make sense. That the idea of Mecca being the center of trade. So really, if we were to take take the seventh century into account, Pamira. Uh, the place where ISIS was involved there a few years ago, that was actually the top of the chain in terms of trade uh, as a location, you know, trade route. Petra was second. Petra used to be much higher in, in importance, but the Romans pushed the trade further north. And since any materials that they traded by land, they, they took the shortest route, which was through Palmyra. But the, the interesting thing about Mecca is like it's totally off the beaten track. You have to go over a mountain range to get to it, and it has no natural resources. I might quote a little bit from, from her. She says, Mecca is tucked away at the edge of the peninsula. Only by the most tortured map reading can it be described as a natural crossroads between a north-south route and an east-west one. So she gives lots of reasons. Um, one of the things that she points to is that uh, scholars have found little evidence of expensive goods being traded by land, or mainly leather and cheap goods like that. Most of the trade in the 7th century is done by sea. To give you an idea, you could, let's say, if you were transporting, say, a kilo of goods, for the same cost of tra uh, transporting by 50 miles by land, you could actually transport it 1,250 miles by sea. Oh, so wow. it was totally uneconomic to go by land. So that's why I think there were probably people uh, raiding caravans because people in that area would have been incredibly poor at the time. Yeah, so Patricia Crona made it abundantly clear that Mecca was not a centre of trade. It, in fact, she didn't find any um, even mention of Mecca on early maps. I think the first mention on a trade route map was in the 9th century, so way too late. The big person really um, beyond Patricia Crona was uh, Dan Gibson, of course. Patricia Crona had established that um, Islam probably began somewhere further north. So it was, um, it was Dan Gibson who narrowed it in his focus to Petra. And uh, he came across he wasn't in, sorry, he came across some evidence that the, the Qiblas were pointing towards Petra. And he didn't believe it at first. In fact, he, when he first noticed that the Qiblas were pointing towards Petra, he actually spent two years checking his data, reading around the subject, trying to get historical evidence that would support that. And being a historian, he, he, was, he went the extra mile, really, to make sure that he, he, he uh, got this right before he presented this to the world. Back in January, I had the uh, opportunity to speak to him, which was the videos on, on my channel. And uh, he spoke with me about the, um, the Umayyads and the Abbasids. Um, he didn't really particularly want to talk about Petra because he kind of felt, I've done that, uh, you know, if you want to see my earlier videos, you know. The, uh, let me give you, sorry, let me give you some examples, if I can read it here, of, of mosques that uh, point in, uh, towards Petra. So uh, there's a mosque in Medina, uh, Guangzhou, Hama, uh, Fustas, which is in Egypt, and Humayma in Jordan. So um, that's just an, a sample. Most of these mosques were within 1% of 100% accuracy. You know, so if you talk about 99% accuracy, you know, Muslims sometimes say, well, they're not 100% accurate. Well, 99% accuracy, you know, if you, if you get 99% get in an exam, you're doing very well. So if you think about the technology of the time, the fact that these mosques were north, south, east and west of Petra, um, and they were all pointing to Petra for the first hundred years of Islam, I think the evidence is really strong. But he, he doesn't stop there with the Qibla evidence. He goes further with that. And uh, um, I'll give you some examples of evidence that he came across. The description in Al Tabari of uh, of Mecca doesn't match with Mecca. For example, he says that it had clay and loam, which is a type of soil that you don't find in Mecca, but matches Petra perfectly. It doesn't have olive trees in Mecca, but it does have olive trees in Petra. So the 
the geography of Mecca matches more clearly um, Petra. Another example is the the alternative name for uh, Mecca, which is given in, in the Quran, which is Baca, which means a place of mourning. That fits nicely with Petra because it was the site of um, the uh, let me just say of ancestral tombs of the kings of Arabia. So it was a place that tribes went to to mourn their family and people used to gather in the tombs and and that was an issue that appears in the hadith you know muhammad has an, an issue of people going to graves to to pray and so on but that was part of the arabic uh, custom the other thing was the zamzam well well the zamzuman is mentioned in the bible and these were giants that lived in mount seir which is right next to petra so there's another connection for you Many of the peoples that are mentioned in the Quran also are from the, the area of Petra or nearby, for example, Ad, Tamud, and, and Midian. Um, so there's a lot of evidence. Um, I have t taken a look at the topography of Mecca and Petra and compared them, and it doesn't match with what Al Tabari describes of Mecca. So, for example, sorry, not Al Tabari, Al Bukhari mentions Muhammad entering the city from the high side and leaving by its lower side. This matches Petra's topography and not uh, Mecca's. So, you know, just using your eyes, I, I, it's, it's hard to believe the Muslims aren't aware that the topography doesn't match the descriptions, but as I'm sure you're aware, a lot of Muslims don't actually look at their sources because they don't have a curiosity about the origins of their religion like we do because they have no need to, to inquire because they just accept it as... as as fact, I'll just give you an example from Al-Bukhari here. He says, Umar used to spend the night at Du Tuwa in between the two Taniyas, and then he would enter Mecca to the Taniya, which is at the higher region. Now, the Taniyas are the narrow mountain passes that cut through Petra. They are world famous. There are no Taniyas. Um, I think they're called Sikhs, S-I-K, or sorry, S-I-Q, nowadays in, um, in the Jordan. So these are those narrow uh, mountain passes that you, you enter through to get to Petra. Another interesting thing is that Petra seems to be missing in all the early Islamic literature, which is kind of weird because it was the capital of Arabia. Um, and this is known from sources such as um, Epiphanius, writing in, in 375, and also Josephus, writing in the first century. They both say that Petra was the capital of Arabia. Just so... You think about it, Petra is in no, no way mentioned once in all the Hadith, which is really weird. So the only explanation for that would be that when they do refer to Mecca, they really are, are referring to the same place. Yeah, that's really yeah. interesting. I, I hadn't heard that particular item. Um, you'd think definitely that, that you'd refer to your capital somewhere. I mean, especially since there's lots and lots of hadiths talking about, you know, a mosque was built here, and a mosque was built in this city, and a mosque was built in this city, but no Petra, no capital, apparently. Yeah, yeah. So, um, one of the things I did as part of my research, I, I heard of a book written by Epiphanius. He, he put together a book on all the heresies of the 4th century. He, he was like fanatical, uh, well not literally fanatical, but he wants to record every single heresy he gets hold of. And I was interested to hear if there was any precursors to Islam. But as I was looking through those, I, I thought to myself, well, I wonder, does he mention Mecca in his book? And uh, no mention of Mecca, which was a bit of a surprise, but he mentions Petra five times. And uh, um, I'll just quote you something from what he said. And um, This is from his work called Panarian. I'm sorry this is a little bit small. I've printed these out in small little, uh, what you call, pages. This is also done in the same way in the city of Petra, in the temple of the idol there. He says, Petra is the capital city of Arabia, the scriptural Edom. They praise the virgin with hymns in the Arab language, calling her in Arabic, Cha'amu, which I'm going to add is Al-Uza, right? So he's confirming that they worshipped al Uza in Petra, okay? He goes on, and the child who is born of her, they call Dusaris. Now, Dusaris, I don't know if you're aware, is an alternative name for Allah. 
So oh, there we wow. have Petra being the location for the two idols mentioned. Um, well, Muslims don't believe Allah is a, an idol, but you have the uh, um, you have Alusa basically referred to as being in existence in Petra, and that's where they worshipped him uh, or worshipped her. Now, Alusa is a bit of a confusing one. There seems to be different mythical stories around uh, these uh, goddesses. In some sources I've looked at, uh, Alusa is the mother of Allah. In others, she's the bride. I couldn't get to the bottom of that, and it's still very confusing. So I'm going to assume that there were just different mythologies, and um, they were never quite ironed out at, you know, at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and for those who are not aware of this, the, the mention of these uh, goddesses uh, from the Quran, I'll just give you that. It's Surah 53, 90 to 20. Um, Muhammad, or Allah, depending on your point of view, says, Have you then considered Alas and al Uza and Manas, the other third? We have found statues of these gods in Petra. To this date, uh, no inscriptions or statues of these gods have ever been found in Mecca. So draw your own conclusions there. Um, I also wanted to mention... I discovered alternative names for Petra, which are very revealing. This was also by Epiphanius. So he says, um, the natives of Petra in Arabia, which is uh, called Rokham, just remember that word, Rokham and Edom, were in awe of Moses because of his miracles. And at one time they made an image of him and mistakenly undertook to worship it. Now, um, so two things to draw from that. Petra's alternative name is Rakim or Rakim, and they were fanatical about Moses. Now, in the Quran, as you probably know, Moses gets a huge amount of mentions, 135 mentions to Moses. This makes sense if, if the Quran was written in Petra. Now, Rakim is mentioned in Surah 18.9. Um, I'm going to actually read you the translation in Arabic. My Arabic is not great. So I may crucify the language. So apologies, Muslims, if you're if you're listening to this. But listen out for the word Rakimi. This is the alternative name for Petra. Am Hasibita Ana Ash Abal Kafi War Rakimi. Right? If you look at most translations given for that uh, Surah 18.9, they translate Rakimi as a dog. Sometimes they translate it as the inscription. So basically. Muslim translators are either giving fake translations or they haven't a clue what Rakimi is any longer mm-hmm. because there was a 200 gap uh, between when the Quran was written and the Hadith and so on, Al Tabari and so on. So they've forgotten what um, our Rakimi is. Sometimes they have assumed that it's one of the dogs from the Seven Sleepers. You even have Muslims having paintings of the seven sleepers with a dog sleeping among them, which is ridiculous. So it's like in the English, do you think that the companions of the cave and of Ar-Rakim were among our wonderful signs? So they basically have, do you think that the companions of the cave and the dog were among our wonderful <laughs> signs? So it's, it's ludicrous. Like, so if, I think one of the key things I've discovered over the past year studying Islam is the key thing, you know, the interpretive key, once you've got this key, you will understand everything, is Muhammad was obsessed with the place he came from. He just loved it. He loved Petra. He loved, he loved the history. He loved the locations. He loved the fact that Sodom and Gomorrah was just up the road. You know, he loved the fact that Paran which is featured with Moses in the desert and so on, is right next door. It's on the doorstep of Petra. He just absolutely loved it. It made him poetic. In fact, one of the things that I would suggest is that he was a poet himself and that his poetic inspiration led him to think that maybe he was getting all of this inspiration from God and then this whole story came from that there. So that would be one of my sort of planks of my thesis. This is probably not great video of me looking at my notes here, but um, Epiphanius <laughs> mentions that Petra used to be a, a hotbed for Arianism and semi-Arianism. And I would think that Arianism is like an early, it's like Islam 1, 1.0, or, or maybe put it the other way, is Islam is Arianism 
he mentions that there was a bishop of Petra that was a signatory in an Arian document, and so and also another bishop uh, called Baruch, who's the bishop of Arabia. So there was a little bit of that. Josephus, then, just moving on from 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 Epiphanius, he mentions that Aaron, the the as in Aaron and Moses, came to a place which the Arabians esteemed their metropolis which was formerly called Arca, but has now the name of Petra. This is from Antiquities uh, 482, He also gives uh, Arachim as the alternative name for Petra, again, just confirming that. He also mentions Petra another few times, but we won't go into that. But the key thing is Metropolis. I want to let everyone know that Metropolis actually means mother of all settlements. Now, why would that interest us? Because the Arabic for that is Um al-Qura, which is found in Surah 692 and 642. So this is an alternative name for Mecca. It matches up with what the Arabians called Petra, the mother of all settlements. And in fact, there's a historical reason for why they, for why they termed that, which is um, the Roman emperor Elagapolis 218 to 222, he officially gave it that title, the metropolis, which is the mother of all settlements. So, obviously, Muhammad being a patron was t intensely proud of this title. You know, everything about Petra he loved. Al Tabari associates Pe uh, Mecca with the Amalekites. Now, for those of you with a Bible, if you look up uh, 1 Chronicles 4 42 to 43, you can see that the Amalekites were destroyed at Mount Seir, which is in Petra. So again, even when they try and cover up the tracks, they try and ship Mecca south or mm -hmm. ship Petra south. They can't cover all the tracks because their their um, their references don't match up any longer. So all the biblical references match up with Petra and no longer with Mecca. Oh yeah, um, just something that people can do if if people have hold of Al Tabri volume two. Look at how Al Tabri tells the story of Abraham, uh, Hagar and Ishmael, right? So <laughs> essentially the story starts in Ber Beersheba. Great, no problem. And it ends with um, Abraham is there with um, Ishmael and Hagar in Mecca. And then he basically sends them off and they, they go looking for water and then they get really thirsty and so on. And then the whole myth of them running back and forth between the two hills got generated from the story. If you compare that with the Bible story, which was in Genesis 21, the story starts off in Beersheba, but it doesn't end in Mecca. Where does it end? It ends right next door in Paran. Paran is like the backyard of Petra. It's that big open desert. And it, and it makes sense in the Bible. It's only a distance of about 65 miles all in, right? right so right. They, they wander in the wilderness of Beersheba first. And then at the end of the story, it says that um, Ishmael is given a wife from Egypt while he was in Paran. Uh -huh. okay, so the story makes perfect sense in the Bible, but when Muslims get hold of it, suddenly they've taken this 1,200-mile journey from Beersheba all the way down to Mecca <laughs> on one bottle of water. Uh -huh. now, now, maybe they had um, flights in those days, you know, Ryanair or, some, you know, or whatever, I don't know. Arab Airways or something, um, and a bottle of water would do you for the flight, but definitely not walking, <laughs> you know? It's just ridiculous. Now, uh, one of the things I, I did not mention so far, which I think is kind of helpful, is people think of Arabia as Saudi Arabia, but in if we want to really understand the, this history, we have to think of Arabia as much looser. The Romans classified Arabia in three categories. Down the south where Yemen is, it was Arabia Felix. In the middle was Arabia Deserta, which is where Hijaz, Mecca, and Medina are found. And then way up north was Arabia Petria, where you find Petra. But that um, expands into the Jordan. It expands northwards to Syria and then westward into the Hejev Desert, which is just south of Israel. So you have a huge area. And so just bear in, that mi in mind that um, the other thing to bear in mind with this, that time and that location is the fact that there weren't just one language spoken in this area. There was Aramaic, there was Greek, there was various dialects of Arabic. There was also lots of different scripts used. There was down in the south of Sabaic script, 
which was used in Yemen, and it was used also in the Jazz, interestingly enough. A very interesting script, if you compare it to the Ethiopian script of the time, it looks almost identical. Most of the letters are similar. Now, if the Quran had been written in the Hejaz, the obvious choice of script would have been the Sabaic script. It didn't have any confusion about dots, or, or, the, or referred to as the diacritical dots, to distinguish one letter from another. It was ready to go. It was used in that area for 1,200 years before Islam came along. So if you just think about it for a moment rationally, if, if the Quran was written in the Hejaz, the, that would have been the ready made script to use. So just say that in passing. I hope it's still working, yeah. Um, I'd like to refer to some non-Muslim contemporary sources, which mm -hmm. I think are quite helpful just to narrow what we actually know about Muhammad and the beginnings of Islam. So one of the sources I, I'm going to refer to is the Armeni Armenian bishop who lived in the 7th century. He was a historian, which is handy as well, Sebius. I believe he wrote this in the 660s, so we're talking this about three decades later. And he simply says that the Arabs assembled and came out from Paran. If you remember, the, the name Paran is right next door to Petra. So that confirms what we're saying, that that desert next to Petra was where the, these um, armies came from. Um, the other non-Muslim source is Thomas Arsruni writing in 887. Now that's quite late, but what he says the following is quite interesting. He says, at that time in a place of Petria, Arabia, Faran, named Mecca, the Mecca, he showed himself to brothers, bandits, warriors, and banshees worshipping in the temple. So I don't know if you've, if, if you got that. He, he says that they the met in Paran, he calls it Petria, Arabia, so you're talking up in the north, and he, he, he says it was the Mecca, not the other one that was still, that was down south that he was aware of at that time. So like in the ninth century, obviously the new Mecca was well established, but Thomas Arts Rooney was aware that there was um, knowledge of the first one mm -hmm. still about. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so while the, the, um, the early, Islamic scholars try to hide that knowledge. Obviously, there were still Christians around who were aware of that. So, what else was I going to say? So, um, I'd like to, to refer you to some um, other scholars of Ame, um, okay. which I found okay. recently, which were very interesting. I'll start with Professor Robert Kerr. And uh, he, he drew my attention to the fact of the three Arabian regions, which I mentioned, uh, which is Felix, Deserta, and Petria. And he is, I'll just give you some of his credentials so we, that he's not just some crackpot. Um, he, he teaches Arabic, Aramaic, and Hebrew languages, and he's an expert in Eucharitic uh, literature, comparative Semitic and religious studies, um, and so on. He's just, a, he's, he's a particular scholar in um, rock inscriptions from Arabia, which is the area of interest for us here. And he was the person who drew my attention to the fact that the Sabaic script was the obvious script that they should have used. And he said that that would indicate that the fact that they used a Nabataean script instead of a Sabaic script shows you that it was from Arabia Petraea. So what they did was for two centuries up to the time of Islam, the people of that area spoke three languages, which would have been Greek, Aramaic, which would be Syro-Aramaic to be particular, and Arabic. They tend to not write Arabic down very much. Mm -hmm. Aramaic was the language, but it gradually fell out of favour. Um, it was probably because of growing nationalism among the Arabs. They started to write Arabic down. So the script that they used was the the, the, the script of the Nabataeans, who were viewed as the top of the, the ladder, you know, among the Arabs, you know. So they used the Nabataean script, but the, the problem that they had was they weren't able to represent all the sounds of Arabic using that script. So that's when the diacritical dots came in later. They came in decades later. So what you have is that they wrote it down in this flawed script, uh -huh. and then later when they introduce the dots it was down to the the scribes to determine where the dots go mm -hmm. now, like for example you can have a dot that, that will mean that the, the letter is a b 
you could have a two dots which would indicate that it's a, it's a th sound and so on and this can have a huge implication for the actual meaning of the script and then um so what else i i do want to refer to um the fact that he also refers to the language not just the script he says the language is uses an awful lot of borrowings from aramaic so you know a lot of muslims believe that arabic was the pure language found in the quran but actually an awful lot of the words in the quran are aramaic and i'd like to just share with you if I may, a few of those words sure. the word for the word quran itself is an aramaic word ironically <laughs> who knew kariana is it in aramaic Psalm, which is the Arabic word for fasting, is actually Salma in um, in Aramaic. And Salah, prayer, Muhammad Salah, the footballer, you know. Salah is actually uh, 100% an Aramaic word that was brought into um, Arabic because it was just a, a useful word. It's a liturgical word. This is important. Um, uh, for those not familiar with the word liturgy, it's, it's the, the language that is used in church. So the Christian churches had uh, uh, their liturgies in Aramaic, right? Mm -hmm. So the words surrounding, uh, words connected with religion were in Aramaic, and those are the words that come into the Quran specifically. So that tells you quite a lot. One of the things that I've uh, figured out a lot is that the primary audience of, of, uh, for Muhammad's preachings were um, early Christians. Mm -hmm. They were from different sects. Some of them were monophysites, some of them were uh, Melkites, some of them were Nestorian. So there was quite a hodgepodge a mix of different Christian groups. Did you want to ask me something before I go on? Because I will keep ravaging here. <laughs> yeah. You know, that you've presented a lot of uh, really strong evidence. Obviously, Muslims will object, and probably the first thing they would say is, well, if that's true, then how did it come to be changed? How did the Quran come how, to be changed? How did the, the Quran and the, you know, the histories and whatnot. Yeah. Okay, so I suppose if we start to focus on how did it actually move south, um, there's two main reasons why the Kaaba in particular was moved south. The first was the second fitna, which is the, the civil war, which I, my, my memory isn't great, so I can't remember exactly when that was. I think it was a, a number of decades after the time of Muhammad. So what happened in that civil war, you have a guy called Zubair who rebelled against the Umayyads, and uh, he basically held out in Petra. Kaaba was destroyed, but the Black Stone was rescued by him and his followers, and they went down south and they reestablished themselves in Mecca. So they're way off in a in a the middle of nowhere in a desert, as far away from civilization uh -huh. as they can possibly get. Now, and later, then there was um, uh, Abdul Al Malik in the 690s. He became the Umayyad leader. Now, it just so happened that his family were from the Hijaz area, and they liked the idea that the Kaaba was now down in this new Mecca. So rather than return it back to Petra, which might have been the logical thing to do at that stage, he fully embraced it. And, you know, being sort of um, a proud person, again, you see the pride in your area. Being uh -huh. a, a family from that area, he took full pride in the idea of the Kaaba being there. And it added to the Umayyads' uh, uh, prestige, but particularly his family's prestige, because obviously it added legitimacy to, to his uh, reign. The Umayyads had to fight, uh, like a, I think it was a three-pronged fight. There were various different groups that were uh, fighting against the Umayyads, and uh, so they, they killed off Zubair, and they made Mecca the, the, the central focus. And I think it was a, around that time then that eventually the, the focus moved from Damascus in Syria Mm -hmm. all the way over to Baghdad, and that was um, the Abbasids. Um, I'm kind of condensing a lot of history here in a few lines, but basically the Abbasids were stationed in Baghdad. And, and this adds another uh, element. One of the reasons why the Hadiths were written and Al-Tabari and so on was to try and justify their power. So mm -hmm. they had to 
They had to have um, a story for Muhammad. They had to, to show that he was connected to them. They were part of the one family. They had to big him up. They had to say that he was the most important person going. In fact, he was practically forgotten for a number of decades after he died. You know, there wasn't much written. There wasn't even inscriptions of, of him in the decades. But suddenly, under uh, Abdul al-Malik, he suddenly became really important. There was an inscription put inside the Dome of the Rock. And that was really the first um, official inscription of, of his name. Around that time, I think it was 691 AD, his name appears for the first time on coins. So you can see there was a clear move to fully embrace Muhammad. He was an Arabic or an Arabian prophet. He had a holy book. He provided the, the Umayyads and later the Abbasids with a reason to unite under this one Arabic empire, which spread across North Africa and, and in, into the Middle East. So it was very convenient to have a religion, a new religion that they could all gel together. The same way as Constantine drew Europe together under the, the religion of Christianity. So similar, similar idea. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Islam probably would have been fairly small this time, so I guess there wouldn't be a lot of uh, resistance to changing things. And also, we do have a fairly analogous situation with the Torah in that the Samaritan version of the Torah, is, which has survived to today, is like 99% the same, but they've changed some of the place names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. So, but yeah. what about the... You know, the, so it's the Civil War. What about the other side? Did they eventually lose the war and that's how their version of history was lost? Or Yeah, um, well, I, I believe that like in that second fitna, the Sunni and Shia divide happened from that. So that, that carried on uh, to this day. And um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about in terms of, like I've mentioned about, you know, the movement of Mecca. So... You know, the Hadiths and all that were, were written to kind of cover up the tracks a little bit on that one. In terms of the Quran, from my studies, I'm going to refer to um, Andrew Bannister's work, first of all. For those who are not familiar with him, he, again, is another uh, scholar. He, he did a, a study of the Quran based on oral literary theory. And oral literary theory su suggests that oral poets would create poems off the cuff using a uh, vast vocabulary and uh, diction and if you analyze a piece of text a bit of writing such as homer's poems you can actually determine whether they were originally composed by oral poets or by literary poets okay the difference being that a literary poet would actually spend a lot more time in getting unique words for their poems whereas an oral poet would tend to use a lot an awful lot of formula so it was formulaic dense um, mm -hmm. And so the standard among scholars who, who follow this um, theory is that a 20% margin is the, the minimum to determine whether it's, a, uh, it's from an oral uh, poetic creation or, I'm not saying this very well, I'm sorry, a 20% uh, threshold is what determines that it's an oral creation as opposed to a literary creation. And what they found in the Quran, when they analyzed all the surahs, they found an average of about 52%. So it's way above the threshold. Now, um, so I would suggest that the, so how it happened, uh, my understanding is, first of all, Muhammad was there to unite all the tribes. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the history that was going on at the time in a second, but essentially he was there to unite all of these different groups or different tribes, different uh, Christian sects, there were also Jewish groupings and so on. He was trying to, to inspire them and trying to gloss over their differences and trying to bring them together. People who were listening to him wrote what he was saying down. Some of the things that were written down were written down much later. So, for example, the, the um, I can't remember which is which, but you have the Meccan surahs and you have the Medinan surahs. I think the Medinan ones was the later ones. But the Meccan ones are much shorter. And the reason for that was they were written down much later. Um, and so people mm -hmm. were kind of doing it from memory. This is according to um, Andrew Bannister. So, okay, so that's the first layer. And then with that script that was written down, 
without the diacritical marks, the then hijazed is up, <laughs> right? So <laughs> the yeah, um, a scholar called uh, Dr. Ahmed um, Al Jalad, who was also another rock inscriptions expert, he determined that the the uh, the grammar that's in the Quran's Arabic is from the Hijaz. He doesn't dispute the Nabataean script. He totally supports that. He supports the idea that there's Aramaic words in there, but he says the the grammar has got Hijazi grammar in it. Mm -hmm. um, now, the Hijaz, at least part of the Hijaz at that time, was within Arabia Petria. So it's not as clear cut. You know, it's not black and white here, but. So at some point, as it's going through different iterations of the Quran, it's it's becoming more um, workable for people living in the Hejaz. So if, as you can imagine, the in the decades that followed the first writing of the Quran, the the Kaabas moved south. People were focusing on the Hejaz area, and now the Quran must match that and have a Hejazi flavor to it. Right. So you have lots of locale references to Petra, but now it's got a taste of the Hijazi about it, right? Um, and then the, the diacritical dots were introduced in Kufa in Iraq, and that was around the 690s, or uh, maybe a bit later, if my memory serves me right, around the time of Abdul Malik. So they were introduced to try and rectify all the confusion about what exactly the text is talking about. So that's like the halfway mark. Right. Uh -huh. And then if we so if we go further in history to say about 750, when the Abbasids come along, the Abbasids um, settled in Baghdad and so on, or, you know, they were acting, working out uh, there. They are dealing with a situation where a lot of their subjects used to be uh, members of the Zoroastrian religion. So it needed a new flavor. So. Uh, elements of Zoroastrianism were introduced into the Quran. Not, not, not a lot, there isn't a huge amount that I could find, but a tiny little bit, a little bit of salt of Zoroastrianism is introduced. But in the Hadith, you see it all, all over the shop. Uh -huh. it's, um, it's everywhere. It's, it's um, like, for example, the description of Allah. He, if you look at a picture of the Zoroastrian god, who I think was called is Mazda, he's got two arms on his right. He's oh, got, nice. you know, and he's got a shin. He literally has uh -huh. a shin, you know, as the Hadith described. But the shin is actually this ring. It's called a shin, but it's a ring which represents the king's authority. Um, and so there's a lot of confusion. But anyway, I could just probably talk a bit more about the Zoroastrian element. But the, the bridge over hell, which I think is you find it in the Hadith, that is a yeah. totally Zoroastrian yeah. idea. Uh, there's some argument that would say that the virgins in paradise also is, comes from, from that time as well. Now, the other thing I would say in passing, in, in, a lot of things get lost in translation over time. There is a very strong argument from Christopher Luxemburg, which you may have heard of, mm -hmm. that suggests mm -hmm. that the Huri was actually originally the white grapes. And if you read these surahs where these Huris are mentioned, the virgins in paradise, if you read the full context, it, it's talking about grapes and wine and so on. And then suddenly these Huris are mentioned. It doesn't make sense. Um, and the boys, the little boys who looked like pearls also doesn't make sense. But actually, there were um, some frescoes found in Egypt from, uh, I think, was the 5th or 6th century. So around the time, just next door to Petra. And they depict um, Abraham feeding the souls in heaven with grapes. So this was a motif, Christian motif from the time. Ah, Something else I want to mention while, I'm, while we're talking about this. Lots of things were borrowed from Christianity in the early Islam. So if you go to many of the churches in that area at the time, they worship on the floor. They didn't have benches. You know, they, they prostrated. They were uh -huh. prostrating not towards the Kaaba, but to the Eucharist in the tabernacle. And uh, the other thing is the monks... St. Antius and St. Pacomius from the 4th century, they invented um, a special prayer rope which had 33 beads. And you, you may be aware that the Muslims today have a prayer rope of 33 beads, which they call the, uh, the misbah. And it's really weird because it makes no sense in the Islamic context. 
But in the Christian context, it makes perfect sense because Jesus lived for 33 years. Uh -huh. And the original prayer that was said was the Jesus prayer on these beats, right? So the Jesus prayer uh -huh. was, uh, Jesus Christ, Son of God, pray for me, a sinner. That was the Jesus prayer, right? And it was said 33 times. The monks would say that all the time, right? So they introduced something to do with Allah in, instead. And, uh, it, and they also they introduced the 99 names for Allah, which were meant to be said on these 33 beats. That was totally to try and make it fit, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. so, so you have all, all these sort of weird things that, that went on, borrowings from the, the Christian environment. Yeah, um, definitely. You got lots of borrowing uh, within the Quran and within the Hadith. Um, you know, you got all kinds of things that make sense in the Bible, but then they don't make any sense in the Quran because they took the story without taking the theology. So definitely you see a lot of that. Right. I, I would like, you know, some people might find it hard to believe that that I'm saying that, that Muhammad was speaking to a primarily Christian audience. There's two things that you were commonly told in the Islamic history. Number one, it was an age of ignorance until Muhammad came along and they were worshipping pagan idols and so on. Now, that did occur to some extent, but it was primarily, from what I've read, a Christian audience. I'll give you an example, um, Surah 5, it's called The Table, right? Verse 112. Um, now, just imagine thinking about this from a Christian perspective, right? And when the disciples said, O Jesus, son of Mary, is your Lord able to bring down for us a feast from heaven? He said, Fear God if you are believers. So we're talking about God being able to bring down a feast from heaven. What does that remind you of? We're thinking of maybe... You know, um, manna from manna. heaven. Yeah. Maybe Jesus saying, um, "I am the bread of life, come down from heaven." Mm -hmm. um, and also, it goes on. They said, "We wish to eat from it, so that our hearts may be reassured and know that you have told us the truth, and be among those who witness it." Jesus said, "Jesus, son of Mary, said, O God, our Lord, and send down to for us a table from heaven to be a festival for us." for the first of us and the last of us, and a sign from you, and provide for us, you are the best of providers. And here's the clincher, right? Verse 115, God said, I will send it down to you, but whoever among you disbelieves thereafter, I will punish him with a punishment the like of which I will never punish any other being. So the worst punishment you could get, according to the Quran, is disbelieving in this, this feast from coming down from heaven which is on the table. Right. Now, if we compare that with St. Paul, sorry, to, I'm talking a lot here, but 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 21, he says, the cup of blessing which we bless is not a participation, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? He also says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So you can clear a clear allusion to St. Paul's writing about the Eucharist. Now, it's ripped out of the Christian context. It now makes no sense. Right. So I hope that makes sense to your, yeah, to your right. viewers, you know? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's a very interesting observation um, that I've never heard. I'm sure most of the viewers have never heard it either. So thank you. If I, I'm going to, I know I'm being interviewed by you, but I'm going to ask you a question. It's a short, <laughs> sure. short question. What does the year 622 AD mean to you in terms of the, the Islamic history? What, what's the significance of that year? So in the traditional history, that would be when uh, Muhammad and his small group of followers had to flee Mecca because they were being persecuted. And exactly. Went to Medina. Okay. Let's hear the real truth of 622. Okay. So um, this, I'm going to be referring to... Um, Professor uh, Peter von Sivers of the Utah University. And by the way, if I was a student in America, that's the university I would go to because there's some great work on this whole area in Utah University. Uh, Dr. Ah um, Ahmed uh, Al Jalad is also at that university. Interesting. But anyway, in 622, there's two areas in North Arabia the, the Ghassanids, which is a, sort of the northwestern area, which is which would cross over um, Arabia Petraea and the Lakhmids over in the, on the east, northeast, okay? They formed an alliance in 622 AD. They basically said they were 
going to set up their own kingdom independent of the Byzantines, you know, the Romans uh-huh. and the Persians. They had been a buffer zone for centuries. And at the time of Muhammad, there were three million federati, which were hired soldiers. One lot were defending the Byzantines. They were the, um, the Ghassanids to the west. For the Persians, they had the Lachmids to the east. So these two groups had been fighting each other. And eventually what happened was in 602, uh, hopefully I can remember this, but there was uh, the, the leader of the, the Lachmids was assassinated by the Persian king. And uh, mm-hmm. I think he, I can't remember his name. Um, I have to look it up. Um, but I think the reason was he, he wanted to marry his daughter and the, um, the, the Lachmid king said no, no chance of it. So he was assassinated. And to the Arabs' credit, they were intensely loyal to their um, Lachmid king. So they basically told the persons where to go. They were not going to fight for them any longer. And they became like rebels for, for the next number of years. Now, from 602 to 622, give or take, the persons had, had, had overtaken the north of, of Arabia. And everyone was fed up of the Persians. In, the, in their area. And so it was like the time was ripe for anyone with a bit of bottle to, uh-huh. to rise up and call the rebellion. And then everyone, Christian, non-Christian, would join in because they were fed up with these Persians. And so along comes two leaders. Um, we don't know from history who the leaders were. But we could probably hazard a guess that Muhammad was one of the leaders. But from, so there was a leader from either side, a leader from the Ghassanids, a leader from the Lachmids. They joined together. Here's the problem that they faced. The Lachmids were Nestorian. The Ghassanids were mainly Monophysites. So one of the things that they needed to do, if they were going to properly join, they needed someone to smooth over the theological differences. Step forward, Muhammad. Muhammad has got a message that he will blend the two together and paper over the cracks. But there was one group among the Monophysites that he wasn't going to tolerate, and they were the Tritheites, uh, sorry, the Tritheites. No, I'm not going to say that right. The, uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce it live on air, but the, the word is Tritheism. These, um, the, these were people who believed that the Trinity was actually three separate gods, right? This mm-hmm. was a heresy that, that started in 570 AD in that uh, general area. There were... Um, patriarchs that were arguing with each other in monasteries the monks were arguing among each other um, some of them were monophysites some were believers in this idea of the trinity being three gods so muhammad refers to this in the quran by saying don't say three you know allah is one right, right? so you have an actual reason for him referring to that and the big mistake the lock um christians make is to assume that allah was was talking about the trinity Nowhere in the Quran does it mention the Trinity. He's actually specifically talking about the monophysites. If he had been slagging off the Trinity, he would never have got the Christians to, to follow him. So he, he managed to get the, Mel, the Melkites, which were the Chalcedonian Christians, alongside. He, he managed to get the monophysites alongside. The only group that he was willing to take on were that small sect that believed in, in God being three separate um, beings. Um, the, the origin for that was a, mis- a mistaken application of Aristotle's concept of substances. Um, I won't go into it now, but basically that's the background to that uh, whole thing. So the more you delve in, into the history, you kind of gradually start to piece together what went on. I'm, I haven't got the full grasp of everything. Um, there's still a lot of areas I'm still a little bit confused about. <laughs> there's that gray area yeah, between okay. the Quran. There's a gray area definitely between the Quran and the Ab- Ab- Abbasids, and there was clearly a lot of work done to hide what really went on. Yeah, well, I think there's, yeah, there's probably some changing of the texts over time, and of course, there's also probably some confusion in the original texts because you're trying to combine on incompatible beliefs, and you're just taking some of their texts and being like. Yeah, they kind of go together. I, I don't understand either, so let's put them together. <laughs> I, I don't know if you if so. Um, Jay Smith was uh, talking on the ladder in Speaker's Corner on um, on Sunday, just gone. 
and uh, he he was referring to Dan Brubaker's work um, the early um, Quranic manuscripts. I don't know if you've if you've seen that. No, or not. I haven't had a chance to see that yet. Um, I remember him talking about it. I think it was in the Hong Kong lecture. And he said, "I can't really reveal it yet because it's not out." So I'm yeah. definitely looking forward to that, but I haven't seen yeah. it yet. Well, actually, one of the things that he found was that all of the early manuscripts have, have been heavily doctored. So there's clear evidence of not just scribal errors, because we, you know, as you know, Christians are well aware that even our, in our own manuscripts, there's lots of scribal errors. That's that's natural, you know. Right. You know, slip the pen, or you know, they, they write down something wrong, and you know, these accretions happen. But what we're talking here is massive doctoring. Um, in one particular page that he showed, there were umpteen insertions of the word Allah into the text, you know, literally just plonked in. Uh huh. Like just um, wherever they could fit it in. Whatever they could fit it in. It was almost like, you know, it's not, it's not um, allified enough, you know, just show it in. <laughs> um, which could suggest that maybe Muhammad never used the word Allah. It's possible that he, he never made any reference to Allah, you know, that's one of the possibilities. But we don't have an early manuscript without these uh, manipulations to the text. Like there was even a whole line that was actually um, erased, you know, completely blanked. Mm -hmm. There, there was sections that had a piece of parchment pasted over it to hide what, what was ever underneath it. A um, lot of stuff. But the funny thing is, all of these early manuscripts now match up with the Hafs Quran of uh, nineteen twenty, I think it is. Which is a bit three, twenty-four, three, something like that. like that. Yeah. <laughs> so one suggestion is that maybe once the Hafs was chosen primarily by most Muslims, I think there might have been a, a move to go back to the earlier manuscripts and then just try and make them all reconcile to what they yeah, what they yeah, agreed yeah. on. Um, Correcting but, it in, in their view, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that's it, really. That's uh, that's that's it all in a nutshell. I, I hope. I haven't talked too much, and uh, it's quite a complicated um, story. I, I haven't referred to the borrowed stories of, of the Quran. Um, I think that might be something. Would that be something you were thinking of talking about? Yeah, yeah, that was one of the possibilities of something I could talk about. So let's uh, leave that for next time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My channel is Sneakers Corner. Um, you know what I've spoken about today is is uh, primarily what I'm interested in. I I sometimes talks about um, things that have uh, come up in Speaker's Corner. Sometimes I just report on what, what went on there, but primarily I'm interested in not so much critique in Islam, but actually just trying to find the true story of of the Islamic origins. And hopefully that, you know, Muslims see what I'm doing as, uh, as an effort to come to the truth. I'm not interested in telling a lie or, or misleading Muslims or anything like that, or, or even really disrespecting the religion. I think every it's in everyone's interest to know what the truth is. And, you know, if the, the true story of Islam's origins is different to what has been received, you know, it's in Muslims' interest to know what that is. So they're, it's based on truth, not on a lie, you know. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think everyone should want to seek out the truth. I mean, what's the point of believing in something if it's a lie? Yeah, yeah. So I've checked out your channel. There's a lot of good stuff on there. Um, there's a hour long or so lecture by uh, Von Sivers, who you referred to most recently. I watched that a couple of days ago. That's really good, really yeah. interesting. Has a lot more material on that, so people should. Oh yeah, uh, check definitely. Out your yeah, there's an awful lot more than what I've been able to talk about in a, in a, in a, you know a short length of time. But definitely look at his stuff. And um, yeah, as I say. Every week, I think, right, I think I've covered everything I can possibly cover mm -hmm. on this topic. And then something comes up and I'm like, oh, no, there's more to this. It well, just, yeah, it's, I, it's a gift that keeps it's, given. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, you know, it's still a very active area of scholarship. So, you know, our understanding is probably going to change a lot. You know, people are just now starting to discover this stuff. If you said, if you, you'd propose something like this uh, 50 years ago, you'd have just been laughed at. So. Yeah, yeah. But now now we're getting a lot more new information. I think, like, even the, the more recent stuff by Dan Gibson, like, um, I've, I've spoken to a guy from Speaker's Corner called Bob the Builder. I don't know if, you, if any of your viewers are aware of him, but he's a fantastic evangelizer in, in Speaker's Corner with Muslims. 
He's not fully bought into my my view on, on, on Islamic origins. I'm kind of trying to win him over on this. Um, so you might find him moving towards this late, maybe uh-huh. at a later stage. But obviously, Jay Smith has been covering this for, for decades now. Yeah. And uh, and actually, in a video that he, he did just today, uh, talking to Bob the Builder, he, he said that the number one thing the Muslims who have, have left Islam and become Christians have said is actually... The historical origins was key to them leaving because they realized that it was bogus, you know, you know. Yeah, because I mean, the the confidence is so much in the person of Muhammad. And when you realize you don't really know much of anything about him, then, you know, your confidence is destroyed. Yeah. One of the things. It's certainly not from reading the Quran. I mean, Muslims, they memorize the Quran, but they don't necessarily even know what the words mean. Yeah. Or even even beyond that, to actually analyze it to the level that we're talking about analyzing it. One of the things I was trying to look up today, I, I read it, I don't know if you've had the experience, you read something somewhere, and then you say say to yourself, I must make a note of that, and then come back to it later, and then forget where you've read it. Uh-huh. But, but one of the things I read was um, the meaning of the various people connected with to Muhammad, and they all have really suspicious names, like, for example, um, if I remember correctly, Aisha or Aisha means virgin, and then Khadija means something else. And all of the meanings connect with their role in the story of Muhammad. And it just looks all a bit suspect, you know. Uh-huh. Um, even even the name Muhammad itself is a bit suspect, the praised one. It, it seems like a title rather than a real name, you know. Yeah, uh, that's what Von Sivir said in his... Uh... And his lecture that you just posted a few days ago. Yeah. Oh, maybe that's where I maybe that's where I see. Maybe I need to go back to him again. Yeah. So, so uh, you also referred to uh, interviewing Dan Gibson. I've also seen that. I also recommend that to people. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll put a link to your channel in the description and yeah, in the he, comment. He, so I recommend people head over there and. Yeah. Yeah. It, that, you know, I would just say that, you know, Dan Gibson is producing a lot of videos at the minute, um, one a week, um, and he's he's got some great material. So, you know, if you really want to get to, to grips with this, you know, check out his channel. Yes. Also check out Dan Gibson's channel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, I think you you've given much. me a lot to think about. Um, you know, like I said, this is an area that I haven't studied in great depth. Uh, in particular, the idea that... Muhammad was trying to appeal mainly to Christians. My interpretation previously is that he's mostly going after Jewish believers. So definitely something to think about. I'm sure you've given my viewers something to think about as yeah. well. I, I so. get, uh, you know, on that, like I, I would say that it's 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 a considered opinion. It's not, you know, right. It's, it's not, not set it's in not stone. And that opinion true. may change based on new evidence as it comes my way, you know. So. Nope, absolutely. You always want to be able to change your opinion based on evidence. Yeah, yeah. But thank you very much. And uh, yeah, looking forward to interviewing you next week. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.